for everyone at home. Good to have you with us uh, as well. Uh, just to say, as we begin, um, you should have your order of service uh, if you are at home, uh, hopefully in, in front of you. Uh, and to encourage you always uh, at home to enter into it. I know as weeks go on, it's very easy um, uh, just to, to watch. But if you uh, are able to stand up and sing uh, for the songs, do sing. And kids, quick word to you if you're at home to try and make it as easy for your parents as possible, because it's quite hard for them sometimes to engage when lots of going around them. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and just to say to everyone here as well, um, let's uh, enter into it as best we're able. And in the songs we can hum, uh, it occurred to me just a couple of weeks ago that we are quite permitted to say the words behind our face masks. Um, so feel free to say the words as well, whatever is necessary to enter in uh, to these uh, words that will be sung uh, to us. I just wanted to begin slightly differently today with a quick comment on yesterday's briefing uh, in the afternoon. Um, churches, it's been clarified since uh, the Prime Minister spoke, will have to close uh, for that month. Uh, and today, you know, the word is it could be longer than a month, uh, so we're going to have to wait and see. So we'll have to major things on Zoom again from next Sunday, and we understand SALT will need to be on Zoom as well, because youth groups are not going to be committed either. Uh, we are allowed to broadcast, so we're going to be thinking a little bit about uh, ways we might do that, uh, whether we do all that on Zoom or whether some of us come here and broadcast. But do pray for us as we seek God's wisdom about that. Personally, as you might have picked up from messages, I, I think it's a bit of a tragedy that during a time of national crisis, churches of all places aren't able to meet as places of prayer and hope for the world in much need of that. Um, and I read to our a member of parliament this morning, I know other people are, and all denominations will be pressurising the government in the next few days to see whether they might revise their decision for churches to close. So do pray for that. Um, churches, as far as I'm aware, there's been no records of infections from uh, church gatherings. So I think there's a good case to be made. It's true to say that many, whether Christian or not, are feeling a little bit of despair as we go into lockdown again. Uh, whilst others are feeling that this is the right thing to be doing for all sorts of reasons, we need to be aware of that and considerate towards that. But it struck me that as Christians, we have in the scriptures a means of processing these times of trial. Uh, and when you read the Bible, it's not always to be processed by a sort of let's G ourselves up and always, you know, feel positive about things. Uh, the Bible also laments. I teach the Psalms on our ministry training course, and 30% of the Psalms are Psalms of lament that bring before the Lord a real sense of despair and concern, uh, and through bringing them to him, actually find those emotions processed to be ones that move to a place of faith and joy and hope. And so I want to encourage you, perhaps, if you're feeling a bit despairing, to enter into the Psalms uh, and enjoy them. I will often work through one uh, phrase by phrase out loud, turning it to prayer. But I thought today we'll begin with a Psalm as well. And if you've got a Bible at home or here, why not turn to Psalm 90? To Psalm 90. But you may find it helpful not to read it in the Bible, just listen and let the words soak in. It's a psalm that, again, deals with the harsh realities of life. The fact that all humanity are living, as it puts it, under the wrath of God because of our, our sin against him. And this psalm vocalises that, but also vocalises the fact that the Lord is always there for those who have put their trust in him. And therefore it moves from that sense of grief and struggle to a place of hope. Why don't we have a, a moment of quiet, just for you to gather your own thoughts and prayers, and then I'll read the psalm slowly, and you might turn its words to prayer even as you hear it, and then I'll lead us in an extended prayer to begin the service. A moment of quiet.
Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the streets of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you reign forever, never ceasing to be our most special dwelling place and hope. And you grant us in the good things of life so much more than we deserve. But as the psalm does, we confess our own sins and the sins of our nation that mean that we rightly suffer all sorts of grief as expressions of your wrath towards humanity our ignoring and twisting of the truth about you, our failure to look to you first in our time of need, the wickedness as a society we delight in through the media, our undermining of the family and of marriage, our violence towards the unborn, our disregard for the needy, our dishonesty and greed that oppresses the poor and wrecks the environment. Lord, if only we knew the power of your anger, we would know how fitting the harshness we can face in life is. Yet, Lord, we are here this afternoon because through the Lord Jesus Christ, you have made us your children, for whom there is now no condemnation, no wrath, no anger. And as your people here today, we therefore join our voices in praying for this current crisis, with the signs we say, relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on us as your servants. Keep and sustain us. Grant us, Lord, we pray, freedom to keep meeting in worship of you and encouragement of each other. And Father, we pray you would bring this pandemic speedily to an end whilst using it to awaken people to number their days. Give us wisdom, Lord. Wisdom to know how best to glorify you before the watching world. And so we pray, may the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, sometimes it's right to feel sober, 
but the psalm is one that ends with hope and we're going to do our kids slot very quickly today and it's a wonderful one today because look at this question and answer what hope does everlasting life hold for us and the answer is that we will live with and enjoy god forever in the new heaven and the new earth where we will be forever free from all sin in a renewed restored creation isn't that good news when we're struggling with the coronavirus look at it again and let's respond by saying the answer together what hope does everlasting life hold for us together that we will live with and enjoy god forever in the new heaven and the new earth where we will be forever free from all sin in a renewed restored creation no more sickness no more death no more struggle, no more strain. I had intended to bring uh, Ruben's broken phone with me to make the point here. Has anyone got a broken phone with them? All right, okay. Well, you can imagine if you can, the difference between a broken phone and a mended phone. And in some ways that's what's going on in this great promise. We and our whole creation is currently broken because we have rebelled against the God who made us. But he hasn't left us in that, though it can sometimes feel that the brokenness is even more apparent as it is at the moment. But he's acted for us in Jesus, hasn't he? To ensure that what is broken will be fixed. That we and this world will have a factory reset where we will be restored to a perfect state where we will live forever with our God and with each other. So that's something to celebrate, isn't it? And Bianca's going to help us in that because she's got uh, the Bible verse to read for us to bring this home. Perhaps the musicians can come up as well so we can go straight from this into our song that celebrates this great truth together. from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, or the old order of things has passed away. Thank you. Round of applause for Bianca. And let's stand, shall we, at home to sing along here. Uh, let's voice these great truths together uh, as we hear this song.
slightly Before we do pray, we're going to just have some notices quickly. This is the first week of the month. That means that we don't have any community groups because we all want to prioritise that Wednesday evening prayer meeting from 7.30 to 8.30 on Zoom. Uh, Salt will be meeting at 7 o'clock on Wednesday then, as they did last time, for people social. And we're encouraging parents, if you could encourage them into the prayer meeting at half past seven, maybe with some snacks or treats or whatever it might be, uh, just as we used to give chips. Last appeared as well for uh, the Blyswood boxes. Uh, we've had a good number uh, given in, which is fantastic. It's a great way to serve those in need this year. Uh, if you haven't done that yet and intend to do, email or text Bethan. Uh, on the note of prayer as well, last week uh, the Sussex Gospel Partnership announced that we're going to give a week to prayer across Sussex, which seems quite fitting, doesn't it, given uh, the current time. Uh, and so we're going to do that in the last week of November. Uh, and what that means is that we will bring forward our uh, early December prayer meeting into that week so that we can really make a, a priority of uh, those evenings of prayer uh, and daytime prayer that's going to be going on uh, during the week of prayer. We'll hear details about that. Uh, and then as we move into December, we'll also, uh, God willing, hold the evenings of prayer meetings so we can really pray for Christmas uh, and all that might be going on. Uh, all that. So do log those in your diaries. Dan, are there any other notices I need to give? That's good. The only other one uh, to mention is that um, if you have uh, emailed your financial commitments for the uh, coming years, uh, some of you have put them here as well. So we've collected those in today. Thank you very much for those. Uh, and it's uh, a real encouragement to hear uh, of financial commitments being made. Uh, towards um, the baby Dan when Sadie Dan moves on uh, in September. And if you haven't yet done that, but you do intend to, please just let Alex know. I would be thankful to God for the provision and we'll assess that. Uh, and we'll just back where we've got to uh, coming down. But for now, why don't I just pray and give thanks to God for your gifts uh, and pray that He will be for His glory. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for sustaining us in so many ways. We realise that for us as Grace Church, uh, all that's been going on at the moment has been somewhat easier for us as a church than it is for many churches. Uh, and we thank you too for the gift financially that you've given us over the years and for the generosity that you've moved folk to as we look ahead. We offer it back to you and we pray, Lord, that you give us great wisdom. Uh, about its use for the way ahead, and we pray that you would provide for us uh, an able minister of the gospel to be trained for a lifetime of ministry. And uh, we do commend Dan and Chloe to you as well as they seek the next step for themselves. We pray, Lord, that you guide and lead them 
into the paths that you prepared for them. And Lord, we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Claire's going to come and lead us on in, in more prayers. So let's maintain that sense. Our psalm reading for today is Psalm 89, verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you that we can meet together today, both in person and on Zoom. Lord, thank you for blessing us all with each other. Lord, we thank and praise you that you are the perfect combination of righteousness, justice, love, and faithfulness. Lord, what an awesome God you are. Lord, when we look around our world, we can easily worry about things around us, things we can't control. Lord, help us not to use our time and energy being fearful or worrying. Lord, nothing is beyond your control. Nothing is too hard for you. Lord, thank you that righteousness and justice are the foundation to your rule as our king, and that love and faithfulness are before you. Lord, help us to remember this daily and forgive us when we forget. Lord, we pray for the UK as England goes into this next period of lockdown. We pray for wisdom for our government as they work out the best way forward to protect as many people as possible. Lord, we pray for clear and accurate advisors and for politicians to understand advice correctly and to make wise decisions. Lord, we continue to pray for all those working in the NHS that you would uh, protect it from being overwhelmed over the winter and that the treatment required for non-COVID illnesses would be able to continue. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our leaders as they make decisions regarding the closure of churches. Lord, we pray for protection over all those who are struggling spiritually at this time. And we pray, Lord, if the church is closed for a period, that we'd be able to support and encourage each other still. Lord, we lift all those we know before you who are ill or struggling at the moment. Lord, we pray for Adele and all her family that you would give her your peace and strength for each day. Lord, we pray for Grace, Adele and Cindy as they look after their new babies during this strange time. We pray that the babies would sleep and feed well and grow healthy. Lord, we lift our Christian brothers and sisters across the world to you, especially those who are being persecuted for their faith. Help us not to forget them in our prayers. Keep them and their families faithful to you and not resentful for their difficult life here on earth. Help them to remember their home is with you in glory. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again before we come uh, to God's word. And it's a good song that speaks some great truths. Um, I, there are some actions I'm going to show them to you at home. You can do these if you want, or you can do them here. So I'm following the king, but I'm following. Um, I'm ready to obey. There we go. To listen to his word. There it is, opened up before us. Uh, yes, Jesus is my king. There's the crown. I'm living now for him. There's my living action. And yes, he's my king. There we go. I love being a minister. I guess to do this. Right, let's stand. Uh, and if you'd like to enter into some actions with me, please. I'm not on my own. Let's think I'm following the king.
Well, in a moment we're going to come to have the Bible read. If you are here with a young child and you think they're not going to cope for the sermon, this is a chance for you uh, to take them out, go home, whatever you want to do, and maybe pick up, I hope, the sermon later on. But Nicola is going to come and read for us. So do turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. So, um, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 17. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have made, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thanks so much for reading, Nicola. Um, hello, everyone at home. Hello, everyone here. It's lovely to see you after half term. Um, particularly as we've just had those wonderful words that scripture is God's word, uh, breathe down. Why? Please make sure that we've got that open. If you've got a handout, kids, there's some there's some boxes you can draw, fill in the uh, the gaps. As we come to this passage, why don't I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we ask and pray now that your word would be a tremendous encouragement to us. Please may your spirit work in our ears, our minds, and our hearts to encourage us to continue. Please help me as I speak. Please would the things that are helpful stay and the things that aren't helpful just get forgotten about. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah. To wait for my screen to get up and I've left my props on the floor, so hang on a moment. And I've been off this week, so I started preparing this sermon a couple of weeks ago, and um, I was kind of asking the question, has anyone here ever felt under pressure? Has anyone ever felt like things are difficult, like things are perhaps overwhelming? Certainly that's been the constant for Timothy throughout the letter, to, to feel under pressure God at like things are difficult, and I guess the announcement yesterday has just made that point really quite profoundly, hasn't it? It's, there's a temptation for Timothy to, uh, to give up in gospel ministry, to feel like he's opposed, but we don't want to keep that idea of being under pressure just to gospel ministers in the pulpit, do we? All of us know what it's like to be under pressure. All of us know what it's like to struggle to feel the difficulty of remaining faithful to Jesus in a world which so often challenges us for it, or in a world which makes it difficult for us. For many of us have been conversations with non-Christians, but perhaps it's just external pressure that makes everyday living for Jesus difficult. So we can sympathise with Timothy's pressure that we've seen throughout this letter. More than that, we actually know it. We do all know what it's like just to feel that voice in the back of our head going to be so easy to give in. It's common to all of us. It's okay to admit that it's common to all of us, that life is difficult. But if we don't address it, if we don't figure out how to live Christianly under pressure, well, we'll be led into cowardice and sin and just to give up. Which is why Paul needs to write to a church leader in verse 14. Look down with me at it. 
This is a guy who's done loads of ministry, knows the scriptures. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. The temptation to stop for Timothy is strong. For the minister, every sermon, every community group and every one-to-one -one represents a potential moment of conflict. As right doctrine is taught, you, you ask the question, how are people going to respond to this? But the general pressure of living everyday Christianity for Jesus brings conflict as well. And so this is a word to all of us, continue in what you've learned. Continue in what you've learned. Of course, if that's the, the driving force, the, the big point to continue, I guess we're going to spend the rest of our time thinking, what's the heart motivation, the encouragement, and what we need to know that's going to help us continue? Like Timothy, what's going to help us keep going, perhaps at a moment where we are feeling under all kinds of pressure, and living for Christ might just feel quite difficult? Well, we've got two things today that are going to help us. I pray, encourage us. To continue. And the first one, what Timothy needs to know, what we need to know, is we need to know godly examples. We need to know godly examples. If you were listening in last week, we had a pretty horrific picture of false teachers, charlatans in the church. They are a negative example. But when negative examples are everywhere, there's a real danger that Timothy is going to follow those. After all, we like to follow examples. I was thinking of an example of this. There are lots of individual um, pictures I can pick, but I thought I'd pick a fairly, a fairly harmless one that hopefully would appeal to lots of the boys in the church of a football team. Now, do you remember the first time you watched a football match and you were captured, you were drawn into it, I want to play this game? Then, you, then maybe you go watch them live then maybe you start practicing like your favourite football player. You start thinking, can I do the nutmegs and the round the worlds? I could never do those. Then maybe you beg to, maybe I can have the shirt. Maybe I can have the haircut. And suddenly you've been inspired by this footballer and you're basically him, just a few feet shorter. The only difference between you and them is that you don't currently play for Barcelona. Examples inspire and shape us. They can destroy us or they can build us up, depending on who we follow. And so Paul sets himself forward as a good example for Timothy to learn from. And what's Timothy supposed to learn from Paul's example? Well, we see three things. The first is that Timothy is going to learn the Christian way to deal with suffering. Timothy is going to learn the Christian way to deal with suffering. How do I suffer? How am I supposed to act when I'm under pressure? What does that look like? That's not a small question. It's a question that I'm sure all of us are asking. How am I supposed to live as a Christian under COVID pressure? How am I supposed to live as a Christian in the workplace where I'm forced to show integrity? Can someone show me what it looks like? Well, Paul offers himself to Timothy as an example. Look down with me at verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? the persecutions I endured. In the face of suffering, Christians are to stick with the truth and endure patiently with faith and love. And Paul is a living example to Timothy of this. In these towns that he mentions back in Acts 13 and 14, Paul planted churches and he saw many converts, but he also faced fierce opposition. Opponents tried to contradict him. Opponents got powerful people to oppose him in their place. 
Opponents poisons the minds of whole crowds against him. And finally, opponents got permission to stone him, which they did. Paul is a Christian example of the principle in verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul knows that it's a non-negotiable for the Christian who tries to live faithfully. Suffering will come. Pressure is inevitable. But because he knows that principle, Paul shows how to live in it. Look at what he can point to. His teaching that chimes with scripture. His way of life. Everything he does. His purpose, the aim to which he's pointing his life. His faith. His patience and his love. He's got a character that isn't knocked about by suffering, but rather stands firm, being Jesus-like. His endurance, his persecutions and his suffering, how he's willing to stick with it, even in the pressure. Paul is an example to Timothy. And is he bragging? Is he inviting comparison? No, he's just saying... Timothy, I'm living because I know this principle. You copy me. Kids, don't copy the footballers with the money and the skills that most of us don't have. Copy God the examples who know how to suffer as Christians. Because all of us will face pressure for being a Christian, and we need to know how to live through it. And so... Timothy learns the Christian way to suffer. Secondly, Timothy learns that God is on the side of his people. Look down with me again at verse 11. After all this, yet the Lord rescued me from all of these persecutions. Paul can say, look, God has worked in my life. And seeing God work in the lives of others, isn't that so encouraging? As Timothy himself goes through pressure. He can see writ large on Paul's life, God's work. He sees the truth that God has united his people to Christ. And so God will never let his people go. That God will care for and protect his people. He will keep their faith. He is on their side, even when the circumstances are tough. Salt, that is a great reason for why you guys should be looking at older Christians as examples. Because they have gone through things in life which you can't even imagine yet, and I can't even imagine yet. And yet God has worked in them in such a way to produce strength of faith. They have examples of God's living in their life, which we can only dream of if we would only ask them. So go and pick older examples. We don't have to figure out faith for ourselves. We've got older saints to show us the way. And third, knowing godly examples, Timothy learns that giving up under pressure will actually mean getting worse, not better. That seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? Under pressure, you just want to give up. It'll be so much easier. But Paul's seen enough of life that in verse 13, look what he says. Evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We saw these people last week. They love themselves. They love money and they love the easy life. I would be so much easier to follow them, we think. In our own context, just think the church that doesn't face pressure, even if it's kind of subtle pressure, because they affirm everything about LGBT and anti-God humanity. The pastor who doesn't preach the hard things and so accrues millions of dollars for himself through prosperity preaching, his life looks so much easier. But look at what Paul says. Their situation is bad. They are deceived, and they're going to get worse. They're liars, and they'll believe more and more lies. And so, Timothy, rather than giving up, 
learn from Paul's example. He has seen evil people, bad going to works. And if Timothy is to give up, that is the way he's going to go as well, from good to bad to worse. Pressure's normal, and godly examples help Timothy to know what to do when pressure comes. Before we move on to our second point, there's something really important here for us, isn't there, when we're thinking about examples? Something for us to take away? I guess when we're thinking about this, there are two directions we can go in. The first is that we need to look for godly examples. And the second is that we are ourselves examples. So I guess, first of all, who are we looking to as our godly examples? Paul's a contrast to the evildoers in verses 1 to 9. Paul's a good example of faithful, I'm living all of life, all for Jesus, Christian living. Who's our, who are our examples? Who are the Christians that we hold up? Is it the worldly successes or is it the faithful ministers? I was trying to think of an example through history and we always pick great bombastic people like Martin Luther and George Whitfield. But I remember actually just to come across a woman like Susanna Wesley, I think is more encouraging for us. Susanna Wesley was the mother of John and Charles Wesley, who transformed the world um, through uh, the, the development of Methodism. But listen to these words of Susanna's life, written in her biography. Although she never preached a sermon, or published a book, or founded a church, Susanna is known as the mother of Methodism. Why? Because two of her sons, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, as children, consciously or unconsciously, applied the example and teachings and circumstances of their home life. What a wonderful, godly example. Not this big, unattainable character, but just someone who faithfully lived at home, teaching her children. Godly living. A wonderful example. And just to encourage us, her sons transformed the world. Godly examples lived at home. They set a pattern for life which can change eternity. Susanna Wesley is a good example for us to look at. If we're thinking, how do I live my everyday Christianity faithfully, wonderfully well? See what God does with us. The second, perhaps more challengingly, what example are we? Christian men in the church, do you know that the young boys, the teenagers in the church, are going to know what it looks like to be a Christian man based on your examples? Christian women, do you know that the young ladies in this church are going to know what faithfulness and godliness looks like because of how they hear you talk and how they see your faith? Older members of SALT, do you realise that you have had eight weeks with a bunch of year sevens and they will have learned what being a Christian teenager looks like from your example. What sort of examples are we to the whole community of the church? Should we be looking to change? Perhaps a question for us. Amazingly, we, each of us, will play an enormous part in the perseverance of other saints. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? So godly examples encourage us. Just to take a break before we move on to the second one, I thought I'd come in and show you my knife. Kids, I wonder, this knife is used for a very specific reason. Does anyone know what I use this knife for? Ophelia? It's not for peeling potatoes, I'm rubbish at that. Joel? It's for whittling, that's a great guess. It's my whittling knife. Now whittling, I take bits of wood and I hack away at them. This is supposed to be um, Chloe's dog, Archie. Um, I guarantee you he's cuter in real life. I use my tool um, to whittle to make little toys and models. It's good for that job. If I had to make something like that on the screen and I just had my little knife, how do you think I'd be feeling? 
Ophelia. Overwhelmed, that's a great answer. I would be feeling overwhelmed and probably pretty frustrated. I need to know I've got the right tools to make something like that and probably the skill. This knife wouldn't cut it. Timothy needs to know that as he lives the Christian life and ministers, he's got the tools to do the job. Has he got a slightly blunt, fairly ordinary looking spiritual whittling knife? Well, the encouragement that Paul gives him in the second point is no, he's got something far better. He knows the complete sufficiency of the word of God. He has the completely sufficient word of God in the scriptures. This book in our hands is the living word of God. It's a supernatural thing. It's God speaking about himself. And as God speaks, things happen. Let's unpack to see what that means. First of all, the scriptures lead us to salvation. Look with me at verse 15. How from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Paul's talking about the whole of scripture here, all of it pointing to our need for Jesus. It is God's revelation of that need. All of scripture points us to our need of salvation, the guilt of our sin and the redeeming perfect sacrifice of Christ. The only access to this faith is through God's revelation. This salvation is explicit, implicit or predicted in the whole of the Bible. I've been reading through the Old Testament recently in the, from the beginning, and I've been finding myself getting very frustrated in Exodus and Numbers and Judges. Because I look at Israel and I go, how can you guys be so stupid? What's wrong with you? They do nothing but complain and betray God. And then I know, as I've read, I've had to check myself because I see that exact same spiritual tendency in me. The same helplessness, all of scripture pointing me towards my desperate need for a saviour, that I can't do it myself. The prophets show us the faithfulness of God and they point to Christ. Job shows us our need for God's sovereignty and to see him in our suffering. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes show us how fallen human wisdom is. Song of Songs shows us the depth of Christ's love for his church. The whole of the Bible, this tool that Timothy's been given as a minister, shows us the need and provision of God's gracious salvation. Which begs the question for Timothy as a minister and for us as congregants, do we read the whole of the Bible? Do we hunger for it as the only way to salvation? Do we read all of it, not just our favourite bits? Do we risk becoming a bit unbalanced or do we want to hear all of what the living God has to say? We need some help. Groups like the Bible Project have some very helpful videos to get us through the tougher bits. All of scripture points to salvation. Timothy, stick with it. It's the tool you need. It's the tool that all of us need to keep going in Christian living under pressure. There is nothing, I repeat, nothing more fundamentally important to human existence than to find salvation through Christ by faith. It is the fundamental thing that every Christian must know. But the scriptures don't stop there. They also equip us for good works. Let me read these famous verses from verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How encouraging for Timothy. God-breathed, useful. The word in verse 17, thoroughly equipped, literally means complete. God's word makes us complete. The implication being is that we're not yet. 
Brian Chappell, the president of Covenant Theological Seminary, he's got this great way of putting it. He says, when you teach the Bible, imagine that you're teaching people who are like Swiss cheese. Every person is like a block of Swiss cheese full of holes. And the point of scripture is to help us fill those holes so that we may be useful cheeses. That last bit was a bit funny. A bit of an answer. <laughs> The point's really quite profound. We're all full of holes. We all want to do good for Christ's sake, don't we? At least I hope we do. We all want to be righteous like God, but we can't. On our own, we're full of sin. We're full of brokenness. We're full of pain. We're full of hurt. We're full of pressure. And we feel that, don't we? But for Timothy, all of Scripture, its purpose, its job, it's useful to fill those holes. It's there to teach us and to rebuke us and to correct us and to train us in righteousness, with the goal being that those gaps in our righteousness are filled. Do we have holes in our knowledge of God where we're taught from his very mouth the very of what he's like from his word? Do we have holes of hard-heartedness or spiritual blindness where we are rebuked by God's word and so we see our predicament? And come back to him. Do we have holes of error? For Timothy, this is especially helpful in an error rife church where the scriptures correct us in all of life. Do we fall short in righteousness where the scriptures train us? The ideas of improvement, making us a better, more complete cheese. And as we get into the scriptures and as God's word does its work, then we will be more ready to do good for Christ. If Timothy neglects this, he will not be complete. He will be helpless, and his church will be too. But if he gives himself to ministering and teaching and reading the word, where God's going to do stuff. God's going to fill those holes, as he's already been doing since Timothy's infancy. This happens in a supernatural way, because God's word is supernatural. This is not a normal book. When God speaks, stuff happens. His words are his actions. So Grace Church, if we want God to do something big in us, if we want to be trained to do something amazing, if we want to be complete, we must go to the place where God is guaranteed us he will work in his living words. Which means under pressure, the place we go is the words. I suspect that in the middle of hard times and the lockdown that is coming, scripture reading may be the first thing that we all want to get rid of. But it's the first thing that we desperately need. Lockdown, I'm sure, is going to knock more holes out of our cheeses, or at least show us that it's there. So in a time of spiritual hunger, why would we deprive ourselves of foods? Why would we want that? The scriptures point us to salvation and how to be complete to do good. What more do we want than that? And so we must commit to and go back to the words. So there is literally no better piece of life advice that I can give you than to read the Bible. It sounds so simple and you've heard it so many times, but there is nothing better I can tell you. I started when I was 15, pretty much every day, although I've missed quite a few. My life's been transformed by it. Literally nothing else I could tell you teenagers after four years of ministering here could be as important as this. Read and commit to the word of God for your salvation and to train you to do good for him. We must commit to scripture and all of Our lives, all of our ministry, all of our church life must be based on scripture. If this is God's living word that does complete us. Is this the case for your life? God's word is the primary tool of ministers. It's the primary tool of everyday Christians. It's the primary tool of the spirit who uses the word that he inspired to change us. In one-to-ones, health checks, text messages, are we hungry for this word? 
Do we see our need for it? Or are we happy for the holes to remain as they are? As we finish, how are we going to keep going under pressure? Well, we're going to know and look to godly examples. And we're going to know and look to God's all-sufficient word. It was enough for Timothy to keep going. And by God's grace, it's going to be the same for us. Why don't we take a moment? I realise it's been quite long. There's stuff for us to think about. And then I'll pray and invite the musicians up. I know I've done a hand over to John. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word does include the reality of being under pressure as Timothy was, as we've seen so much of. Your word also shows us what we are to look to. Godly examples that show us how to live Christianly, and your word which trains us to live Christianly. Father, please help us to commit to both, particularly at this time, I'm sure, of what will be spiritual difficulty for many of us. Please would we double down on the things we know are good for us, that we may be built up for your good purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, really encouraging word. And before we sing, we're going to share the Lord's Supper together. So at home, I hope you might have uh, some bread and wine with you. Um, and we have some on the table over here, some wine at least. Uh, I hope you've got a cup and some bread. Now, just a reminder, you know, in the Lord's Supper, we have symbols. The bread reminding us of Christ's body broken for us, the wine, his blood poured out, and the table reminding us that our future is to feast together with one another and with Jesus in the coming kingdom of God. Now, during uh, this pandemic, some churches have chosen not to have folks celebrate communion who aren't present, um, who are at home. The reason we've not gone that way, as many churches uh, also haven't gone that way, is because we are one in Christ. Uh, we are joined together spiritually, uh, and the significance of the supper is in the symbolism which we can all imagine as we look at the bread, the wine, consider the table, uh, and our sense of oneness as a fellowship, a oneness that's going to carry on from this life into the next. So whether you are here in person or you're at home, we're together in the spirit, around the table with our Lord Jesus, looking to him with sincere faith to cleanse us from our sin, to nourish us just as food and drink does, and to strengthen us, therefore, for our Christian living. Well, as always, can I say that the supper is for those who have been baptised, who are living as Christians, who trust uh, the truths of the faith, calling on Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, submitting to him as Lord. If that's not you, then please do uh, just refrain and think uh, on the significance of what's taking place. But to start, we're going to do a slightly different uh, acclamation. We usually say the Apostles' Creed, but what we've got here are some words that have been said since the fourth century, the beginning uh, of a great hymn. Uh, and they're wonderful scripture words that pick up our faith in God the Holy Trinity. So do join, please, in saying the words in bold or on the screen that are, are given to you as the congregation. And so we say together, we praise you, O God, we acclaim you as the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting, to you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The apostles, prophets, and martyrs praise you with a holy church throughout the world, the Father of unbounded majesty, your true and only Son, worthy of all honour. The Holy Spirit, who is our advocate and guide, we praise you. 
wonderful words that pack up the praise in heaven uh, of all angels and all God's people. Well, it was while eating a Passover meal the night before his death that Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after the supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray, shall we? Happy Father, as we come to share in this supper, whether here in person or at home, we give you such thanks for all the blessings of creation that we enjoy almost without thought. But we thank you especially for the gift of Christ. We thank you for the cross that in this supper we proclaim until he comes again. And we pray that as we eat and drink, we pray that through these symbols, you would draw from our hearts a more sincere trust in the Lord Jesus who is at your side and present by his spirit. And we pray therefore that we would experience the reassurance of forgiveness and the strengthening that you give for our living as your people this day and for the coming days. And we ask in Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, let's say these words that we say so commonly together as a way really of praying that we would receive rightly uh, the bread and the wine. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and you share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Well, the way we're going to do this is as we've done it before, uh, which is that first we will uh, eat uh, bread together and then I will come around and pour a little bit of wine uh, for you to drink as well. Um, so let's take our bread and eat, remembering that Christ died for us, and let's feed on him in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. in our cups and then if you would just hold that and we'll drink together uh, when we're all done.
So let's drink, remembering that Christ died for us uh, and be thankful. Now let's say the Lord's Prayer, uh, a great way of committing ourselves to the Lord in response uh, to all that he's given for us. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, the singers are going to come up. We're going to finish singing together. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let's make this our song in coming days, shall we? Puzzle's just removed. Yeah, we're waiting. Let's start again from the beginning, shall we?
may the Lord direct our hearts to the love and peace of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Amen. 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 Well, do take your seats if you're here. If you're at home, can I say goodbye? I'll talk to you. Hang on. <clears throat> uh, bless you, everyone at home. Uh, we'll all be uh, on Zoom pretty much next week, but do stay around at home and talk with others on Zoom for a few moments uh, if you can to enjoy some sense of fellowship. Uh, and to all of us here, if you could just wait for the stewards to usher you out in an orderly manner, that would be wonderful. Uh, but do uh, go in the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord.